Okay, thank you, Vidra, for your introduction. I think uh, Vidra has covered more about me. Uh, we can straight away go to the today's session. And uh, today's session is mainly about uh, building or designing uh, event-driven application or event-driven solutions. And uh, the primary aim of this session is to cover what to do and what not to do when you are dealing with or when you are designing event-driven applications. And uh, I've been working in this domain for nearly 10 years now. I was contributing to the stream processing engine uh, for nearly 10 years uh, before moving to the solution architecture team. Then uh, I'm trying to put these topics in a very simple manner to understand. And uh, if you have any, any detail or in-depth discussion, I'll be around here. We can discuss further on that. OK, to start with, uh, I like to go with a few use cases. Here, it's a simple use case about uh, retail or e-commerce uh, application. The generally, what happens is when you build a, such an application, let's assume you are receiving an order to process. Ultimately, uh, first thing is you process the payments. Right? Once process, uh, payments is processed, then the order is confirmed. Now, once order is confirmed, then you'll be sending a confirmation details to the specific buyer. But there are a few other operations you have to perform after that. What are them? You have to update the inventory about the, uh, regarding the inventory change. You have to update the shipping service about the new shipping. Maybe you have to update the sales also regarding the after sales details, right? Now, here what we have done is we are kind of, uh, I've tried to show like a service kind of manner. We are, Mostly, uh, once order is processed, it's tried to send an order to the uh, kind of update to the inventory management. Again, another request to the service, uh, shipping service, and another request to the sales uh, department. Now, it's a, like a request-driven approach. You make a request, update them, and after that, you update shipping service, something like that. And uh, once all of these updates are completed, then it's tried to send the uh, order confirmation to the user. Now here, there are few things, are there? What are they? These services here, these not necessarily need to happen in a synchronous manner. You can perform in a synchronous manner as well. And again, uh, the services also needs to be available at all the time, if you are making a request-driven approach. Right? And then let's assume we are trying to build this system using an event-driven approach, right? rather going with a request-driven approach. And here, what we are doing is we are going to bring up a, maybe an event broker or message broker in between the order processing engine and other specific uh, services here. Right? Because since these services are asynchronous, then definitely we don't have to perform in a kind of immediately. Rather, what happened here is once order is confirmed, it send a confirmation order to the user. Then it send an event to the event broker or message broker. Right? Now, once this order confirmation event is sent, then it's a matter of other services who are inter interested in this event to do processing after that. Right? Then we can do things more asynchronous manner. Here, the interesting thing is the coupling is not there between the services. And again, you can perform asynchronously. And uh, the services, let's assume there's one service is not available at a given time. It won't be a big issue because rather, once it's available, it's going to get the event and process it. And it's going to utilize some of the capability in the message broker, event broker. Right? Similar to that, let's take another example, uh, maybe something like this. Uh, you are booking a ride using an Uber or Lyft. And once you book, let's assume you're making a ride request, ride is confirmed. After ride is confirmed, the next thing is you want to un uh, get an update about the status of the taxi, right? And here, it's, it's, you need to get the update kind of a, what do you call, frequent live update, something like that. Then you subscribe for the updates, and you'll get those updates. Then here, event-driven is more, more, more good approach, more kind of natural approach. But if you try to implement the same thing with the request-driven manner, you have to send the request every time to get an up update, right? Likewise, in, 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 in industry, or when we are doing designs, there are use cases which we need to apply event-driven design, and it makes sense at that time. 
And this is also one of the use case. I'm not going into detail. Rather, I think many years back, many of us uh, faced COVID-19 pandemic situation. And at that time, even public and the government entities, and even government, uh, many uh, in, uh, organization faced important problem on sharing data between the different parties who are interested in that, right? And for that situation, what you can understand is event or data becoming a more important or kind of a important character or important thing in that whole thing, right? And for such kind of use cases also, event-driven would be the natural option to go with, and you can get the advantage of it. Now we know, okay, there are use cases or there are um, um, designs that we have to go for the event-driven approach. Now, okay, what are the key concepts and components in the event-driven design? First thing is event. In an API first design, the API is an important thing, right? Likewise, in the event-driven design, event is a very important thing. Right? The next thing is event schema, or definition of the event, or structure of the event. Right? In the API, we have Swagger definitions or open API definitions. Something like the event schema is also very much important. Right? And there are various initiatives that are happening to come up with the better structure for event, like cloud events is one of the such initiatives, and there are a lot of work going on. And likewise, event producer, event consumer, event producer is something, produce the event, event consumer is consuming the event, and event broker, event broker is like a middleman between the event producer and consumer, who's going to act as a kind of, trying to provide the, what do you call, uh, trying to kind of break the coupling between the producer and consumer. Right. And next one is event processing. These are the main, what I call, concepts or components in the event-driven design. And event broker is the key concept in that. In, in an event-driven design, or when you try to implement event-driven design, more than 95% of the time, you understand the need of event broker or message broker in that design. Whenever you think about reliability in event-driven design, you understand, okay, there's a need for the event broker or message broker in it. And uh, there are a lot of message brokers or event brokers are there in the market. We can start from ActiveMQ, Cupid, IBM MQ, Kafka, and we can go to Nets. Likewise, we have different brokers. Each and every broker have different characteristics, different capabilities. And sometimes using some of the broker might be overkill for your solution. Right? Then whenever you select a broker, or even message broker to your design, first understand what I need from the event broker. What is the characteristics I'm looking for in the event broker? And based on that, go for that. Don't overkill by getting a message broker which, which, which you have to spend, I think, uh, many man hours to even to, what do you call, to, to manage that deployment. Right? And uh, generally, message brokers, event brokers support two common patterns, right? Topic and queues. Topic means all the events will be duplicated between the consumers, and the queue means the event will be uh, kind of shared between the consumers in the round robin manner. Right? Generally, uh, message brokers support both in-memory and file-based, system-based kind of message stores, and select what is the best approach that you need. If you need the reliability, definitely you have to go for a file-based message brokers. Now. In the event broker or message broker, there are a few important non-functional requirements we have to meet, or QoV, as we said. And the first thing is persistence. That means we cannot lose the event by any chance. There's a risk of losing the event. Then definitely, you have to understand, OK, what kind of message store that I would go for when I'm selecting the message broker. Then the next one is at least once, sorry, at least once delivery. That means the event or message can be duplicated, but you cannot lose the event. Likewise, there's something called at most one delivery as well. That means you can lose the event, but you cannot duplicate the event. But you, have to send a, you can send once, something like that. Exactly one delivery. That means you cannot duplicate or lose the event. You have to send once. That is a mandatory. And in order delivery, the order of the event cannot be missed. It has to be in order. Generally, achieving these two, exactly one delivery and in-order delivery is pretty hard in event-driven design, or when you're building such a thing. 
But there are brokers which provide the capabilities to achieve this. And also, when you are trying to implement such an integration, you have to plan and build design to meet these requirements if you have such a requirements. And uh, now we understood, OK, event broker plays an important role. But generally, in, I've been working in 10 years in different uh, event-driven uh, applications and architectures. I never seen event brokers are exposed to the external world outside the organization. Event broker is only within the organization boundary. Right? Now, if event broker is within the organization boundary, the next question is, OK, how are you going to get the event from outside the organization boundary? And how are you going to send the event to the outside the organization boundary? There are two things, incoming and outgoing part. Okay. Now, if you want to bring event from the outside organization boundary or send outside the organization boundary, you need something called proxies. Okay. Now, what is these proxies? There are hundreds of proxies or different ways to get events to your organization. Okay. WSO2 Micro Integrator or Ballerina both supports majority of these proxies which are commonly used in the market now. The very old style and simple way of achieving is typical HTTP kind of request. You send an event in a request manner. But does it a streaming friendly approach? No, it is not a streaming friendly approach. Maximum you can send maybe 1,000 to 2,000 events per second, something like that in a HTTP kind of request approach. But in use cases where you don't have high TPS, then you can go for that, because it's simple. Uh, WebSocket is a very commonly used one. It's a kind of full duplex approach, where once connection is made between the client and server, then you can transfer events between the client and server continuously. But here, the, uh, you, you need a kind of persistent connection, and it provides a low latency. But important thing here is, uh, I, I, never, I have seen their kind of hesitance in the, in the industry or in the, in the uh, enterprise security people when they're exposing a WebSocket endpoints to outside. I rarely, see, I rarely seen people are exposing this to outside world. Next one is WebSub. WebSub is a very good or streaming friendly approach to send events or consume events um, to the, within the, uh, from the outside. But here it requires additional infrastructure you need something called hub here, where server will advertise what is the hub you have to go to collect the events. Then client has to go and subscribe to the hub, and hub verify the, your subscription. Then once hub has any new events from the publisher, then it will send those events to the client. Right. Likewise, WebSub, we have webbook approach. Webbook is simple, right, uh, what do you call, um, old style callback approach to send events, right? That means if you're interested in getting some events, you go and say to the server, okay, this is my endpoint. If you receive an event, please send it to me, right? Typical callback approach. And the polling client is another approach which used, uh, I think, in the old days, uh, generally, when you are dealing with message broken, et cetera, polling client is one of the approach to get the events to internally. Likewise, there are multiple ways, multiple proxies are there to consume event. But here, whenever you decide, OK, what is the proxy I'm going to select, think about what is the TPS that you are looking for, means performance, what is the throughput that you are looking for. Some of these proxies can give even thousands of events per second. Or some of these can give even millions per events per second, based on the requirement. But some only can give maybe 100 events per second. Right? And decide what is the approach is suitable for your approach. And based on that, select the proxy. Then next one is, OK, now I got the event. What is next? Next thing is event processing. Event processing is a very interesting domain. Even we can talk about it many hours. And uh, generally, we, different terms are used in that, like simple event processing, complex event processing, stream processing. There are a lot of overlaps between them. But I like to kind of categorize into two simple manner, stateless event processing, stateful event processing. What is stateless event processing? If you try to do processing by only look at one single event, that is a stateless event processing. Very easy to perform, no, no complexity.
But stateful event processing means you're going to look at more than one event and do processing. Stateless, state, full event processing is complex. It's not easy. Because whenever there is a state, there are some additional problems kind of hang into that. What are these? OK, if it's a state, how I'm going to uh, keep the state? Is it in memory? If it's in memory, OK. If there's any failures, how I'm going to, uh, what do you call, uh, get the state back? Then you have to go for checkpointing. Likewise, many other problems kind of come into the picture whenever you talk about stateful run processing. And there are different, what do you call, solutions are there, complex event processing tools are there, uh, event processing tools are there, and you can use that and achieve it. But it's kind of complex. But it's not impossible, it's complex. Now, we talked about, OK, we talked about what to do and what, 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 are, the, uh, what are the characteristics in the event-driven design, et cetera. Now, OK, when, when you need to select event-driven design, or what are the uh, benefits out of it, and what are the common mistakes that we can make on that? Right? And benefits are, importantly, scale independently. Because as soon as you bring an event broker, something like that, then there's a decoupling between the event producer and also the consumer. Then it's more easy for you to, uh, if you want to scale something, you can scale it more easily. And, uh, fail independently, right? For example, in the earlier first use case which I mentioned about e-commerce, you can see uh, there are three different asynchronous services were there, like one for shipping, other one for uh, inventory management, and etc. Let's assume there is inventory management services failed, but it doesn't affect the other service, right? It's typically more like, because whenever we go for such event broker, it becomes more like a microservice kind of world, and you're trying to achieve that capabilities. And easy to adding services. Easy to adding services means there is an event broker, and there are three services already there in the first use case which we discussed. Now, let's assume you have another service which you want to do something by looking at the order confirmation event. Then it's a matter of adding that service to that design. You can achieve it easier. Then the resilience to event burst, it's another interesting capability because services can fail when you try to hit that in a burst manner. Then if you have event broke in middle, then you can achieve, you can handle the event burst as well. Then challenges, the main challenge is it, it's kind of a bit complex. And also the debugging is not easy. Means in the request-driven approach, it's so easy to debug things. It's a matter of sending an event, get the response, validate it, and see whether it's performed or not. But in an event-driven approach, there are multiple asynchronous nodes are there, points are there. Then debugging is kind of becoming complex. And uh, next one is, what are the common mistakes that we can make? The most important mistake is, as soon as someone learned about, understood the event-driven, they try to apply it for everywhere, for all the use cases. The same applies to request-driven as well. That is the most important mistake that someone can make. Don't apply event-driven universally. Understand whether that, whether that use case need an event-driven requirement for it. The next one is disregarding the importance of event schema. Because like an API, whenever you design an API, you spend time, the structure of the API, to decide, OK, how it's going to evolve many years, what kind of flexibility it needs to have, something like that. Same manner, spend more time on defining the event schema. That is very much important whenever you try to come up with the event-driven design. Then, most interesting thing is attempting to replace necessity for event broker with the database. I've seen a lot of uh, places that they try to replace event broker using a database. In a simple manner, it might work. It will help. But as soon as you try to scale it, then you start, the, you start getting the problems in that design. You'll feel more problems on the event duplications. Whenever you add more nodes, you'll feel the event duplication problems likewise. Then don't try to replace event broker with the database, and also vice versa. Don't try to replace a database with event broker as well. That's also not going to help. Both of them have their own unique capability, which we have to utilize. Then, not evaluating the adaptability of existing deployment architecture. 
because event driven design is a something which we have to uh, uh, which we have to spend time and implement. And as I mentioned earlier, stateful event processing have a unique needs to, uh, to achieve in a deployment architecture. You have to think about how the states are maintained, how we are going to roll back the states, and etc. Then think whether your existing deployment architecture supports that. If not, plan about it, okay, how I'm going to support it. And uh, next one is, okay, when to choose event-driven paradigm. The most important thing is when the throughput is proceeds the latency. Normally, whenever in the event-driven design in any place, when the throughput increases, the latency also increases. You have to find out what is the balance between them. Sometimes the latency is not an important thing. The throughput is very important. Right? Then decide what is the most important thing. Most of the time, in event-driven design, throughput might be an important thing. At that time, it might be a good option. Even if you're having latency requirement also, you can mismatch that. You can match both of them at the same time. Then parallel processing needs in the integration. That means if you have an asynchronous nature and if you can do processing parallelly, then event-driven might be a good option. Then the loose coupling is, <clears throat> is essential in between the component. That means you need to decouple the uh, producer or the consumers. Likewise, if you want to have a loose coupling between them, then event-driven might be a good option. Likewise, there are some uh, requirements you might have and think about whether event-driven might be a good option at that time. Okay, now the conclusion. Okay. The important conclusion is, like any other design pattern, like request-driven, event-driven also works for some use cases, not for all, and don't overuse it, and don't apply it widely, universally. Then, Event brokers are unavoidable in event-driven design. Don't try to replace with a database, and vice versa. And uh, whenever you design an event-driven, sorry, whenever you try to make event-driven design or try to build event-driven design, it involves some, some, that is different from how you implement request-driven designs, right? And understand the complexity on that, spend time on that, and try to do it correctly at once, at least the design, then you can kind of evolve and improve your deployment architecture later as well. Yeah, I think that's all for the today's session, and uh, thank you, thank you everyone.